وقال ابن الملقن الشافعي كل من خرج على الإمام الحق الذي اتفقت الجماعة عليه يسمى خارجيا anyone that rebel not just make takfir and gets a leader who is well established to be a leader then is a خارجي so he read the statement and then all of a sudden his face changed into a cabbage it's like his soul came out of him let me present to you why Naam didn't want to read the next bit. Let's read it. So anyone that rebels against a ruler who the people agreed upon is called a Khariji. Look at the part he missed out. Regardless, even if it was in the time of the companions or after them. Why didn't you tell the people that it's regardless whether it's in the time of the companions or after them? You were using this as evidence for yourself to call the people Khawarij. So what about the Salaf and the Tabi'un and the Sahaba that rebelled against the rulers of their time? Based on your statement here, mate, they're Khawarij. You've labeled them as Khawarij. Anyone that rebel, not just make takfir, and gets a leader who's well established to be a leader. Khawarijiyan. Naam? The context here is, my friend, it applies to the Al Khawarij, meaning the original Khawarij. And how do we know this? Let's read on. Regardless, even if it was in the time of the companions or after them. As it's confirmed and narrated, and as it's been transmitted in his Nihal. This is the book he was referring to. Al Milan. والنحل. They madhab throughout the madahib of the khawarij. They make takfir of the one that commits a major sin. They see that khuruj against the imam which opposes the sunnah is a haqqan wajiban. This statement has got nothing to do with just general khuruj. It's connected with the aqidah of the khawarij. And he said to hear and obey the leaders, righteous or evil leader, those who the people agreed upon or the one who took the leadership with with fighting, naam? <laughs> Did you figure that out? Have you figured it out what just happened? So if he took the leadership by fighting, then that leader himself rebelled against the previous leader. He, according to you, became a Khariji. So that basically means we're supposed to give bay'ah and obey a Khariji innovator who goes against the Sunnah. So why if that other ruler rebels against the Khariji innovator that took over? Is he, does he become a Khariji now? What happens? Because you got no principles and at the end of the day you want to jump from this pillar to that post. Because we love the tyrants. No. Because we love the Muslims. We care about the Muslims. We don't want to see civil war in our countries. When our enemies killing our brothers and sisters in our countries and we are fighting each other, killing each other. You know how deceptive this bootlicker is? When he mentions the countries that are facing problems in the Muslim lands, he always mentions Libya and Syria. But you notice he never mentions Yemen. You notice he never mentions Yemen. Do you know why? I'm going to present to you now official independent human rights reports showing you the massacres that have been caused by Saudi Arabia. And the report is called Withering Life. Human rights situation in Yemen 2018. He says, in 2018, Muwattana documented at least 150 airstrikes against civilians. The attacks killed at least 375 civilians and wounded 427 others, including 174 children and 55 women. The attacks damaged private property and critical infrastructure and struck residential neighborhoods, villages, roads, markets, service providing and other commercial facilities, boats and civilian vehicles. And this is just one example from one report. I challenge you, come out publicly, condemn this. You love the Muslims, don't you? You love the Muslims. Selective mate. You always mention Syria and you always mention Libya. Why don't you ever mention Yemen? Because your masters are actually indiscriminately killing them. You don't whisper that, do you? Because you don't care mate. You are a, such a hypocrite. That's the reality. I'm going to call you out. And until you do my friend, I'm going to call you out. We condemn the innocent civilian life lost in Yemen caused by MBS and Saudi Arabia. I condemn MBS and I condemn Saudi Arabia because I love the Muslims. But today the guys are backtracking. And uh, he's saying here, put a comment in his channel, I believe. And he said, this is why I said it's, it's better not to do khuruj. So he said I was backtracking. And he said that I said it's better not to do khuruj. What this idiot don't realize is, one, I said it to your face when I spoke to you at Speaker's Corner. And two, if you review my videos, which I'm going to play, I've constantly had that principle. That is better not to do khuruj. And we've quite categorically stated, the brothers here, that we haven't called for any rebellion in any of the lands. It is better not to do it. So as you heard, two, three months ago, I've said it's better not to do khuruj. So how are I backtracked? I've had this principle from day one. So you've lied once again. 
How many lies are you going to add on top of your lies? When he called us bootlicker because they do not rebel, you know who's calling his well bootlickers as well? Sahaba. Abdullah ibn Umar, he was clearly against anyone rebelling against the Yazid. And he said to them, I'm free from anyone rebel against Yazid. So what would you call him bootlicker? You know why your bootlickers and anyone that did it with their ijtihad are not? Because they didn't call the opposing side Khawarij. Why don't we call them bootlickers? Because they didn't accuse the opponents who did or disagreed with them as Khawarij. He mentioned Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhuma regarding him disencouraging his family to rebel against Yazid. But does he know what Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhuma regretted when he was on his deathbed? Now as you can see on screen, the book Seer al-Alam al by Imam al-Dahbi rahimahullah. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhuma didn't participate in the fitna against Yazid and disencouraged his family and friends to do so. But he regretted not fighting against Hajjaj. So why didn't you mention that, Namsi? So, what have you got to say for yourself, mate? You're just institutionalized. You said the Hajji has proofs, correct? Well, ask what is the proof you said you say. Then I put another Sahaba, they did something, Allah forgive them, and they made mistakes. Sahaba, Radhi Anhu, made mistakes, and Hussein made a mistake. May Allah forgive them. Okay. Hussein Radhi Anhu did not make a mistake. Let's see what the Grand Hanabila and others have said about Hussein Radhi Anhu. Ibn Aqil and Ibn Jawzi, senior Hanbali jurists, permitted rebelling against an unjust ruler. Then they further go on to say, وَذَكَرَ خُرُوجِ الْحُسَيْنَ عَلَى الْيَزِيدِ إِقَامَةَ الْحَقِّ وَهُوَ ظَاهِرُ كَلَامِ Ibn Razin al Hussein rebelled against Yazid to establish the truth. This is the apparent view of Ibn Razin. Who said Hussein radiallahu anhu made a mistake? Major Hanbali scholars have said that Hussein radiallahu anhu rebelled against Yazid to establish the truth. Who are you going to take? Ibn Jawzi, Ibn Aqil, major Hanbali scholars. Or are we going to take Namsi from Speaker's Corner? The Sahaba, they did something, Allah forgive them, and they made mistakes. Because the classical scholars had no impact on Namsi, let's bring one of his own. The son of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. We've got the book, Jawab Ahl Sunnah Nabawiya. And this was the saying of Ali ibn Abi Talib and those with him from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum Ka Ammar bin Yasir wa ibn Abbas wa Abi Sa'id al-Khudri wa huwa qawl ummu al-mu'mineen wa man ma'aha min al-Sahaba Ka Amr bin As wa Nu'man bin Bashir And these are the companions that said that you could also unsheath your sword against the rulers to enjoin the good and forbid the evil wa huwa qawl Abdullah ibn Zubair wa Hussein bin Ali you said he made a mistake and amongst them is Hussein radiallahu anhu and Abdullah bin Zubair. So how did they make a mistake? They did ijtihad, they did ta'wil and they did khuruj. Khalas. So you need to make tawbah from this mate. Hussein radiallahu anhu did not make a mistake when he did khuruj against Yazid. He did not make a mistake. And they made mistakes. So he tried to, in a sense, degrade Hussein radiallahu anhu and other companions. So I said Hussein radiallahu anhu made a mistake and other companions made a mistake. But you never say this about Rabi' al-Madkhali and the Saudi rulers. You don't say they made mistakes. But you're quick to say that the Sahaba who made a mistake. Some Sahaba is in Bukhari. That's what Shia say. Say, hold a minute. You say Mut'ah is haram, but some Sahaba gave it to her about Mut'ah. Did Namsi tell you what the actual reasons of Ibn Abbas was for Mut'ah? Did you do your research on this? No, you didn't, did you? Sahil Bukhari. And as you can see on screen, and it's a hadith number 5116. And Ibn Abbas was asked regarding temporary marriage with women. So he allowed it. One of his slaves said, only in harsh condition, when there is lack of women or something of that sort. So Ibn Abbas said yes. It was because when it's in harsh condition. Now, what does that mean? You can see Sunan al-Kubra by Al-Bayhaqi. Hadith number 14166. Ibn Abbas anhuma, responded to the criticism of Sa'id ibn Jubair on his view on muta by saying, I did not intend that, nor did I give such ruling regarding muta'ah. Muta'ah is not permitted except in case of necessity. Indeed, it is like the dead meat, blood and the flesh of the swine. It is clear from this narration, Namsi, that Ibn Abbas didn't legalize muta'ah the way the Shia legalize it. He didn't say it's halal to do muta'ah the way the Shia do it. So don't use that comparison with Ibn Abbas. Are you promoting the Shia line of argument now? You're supposed to be defending Ibn Abbas. Wallah, I think this is ajeeb. Then Ibn Qudama goes on to say, it's upon the people to aid their leader to fight against the transgressors. Because if the people left him without any help, those who rebelled against him, they will overpower him and corruption will spread upon the earth. A Hajji, Al Jahil, he, he wants to explain what Ibn Qudama meant. He said the likes of those who rebelled against Yazid and Al Hajjaj. But he said, yeah, you should fight against 
with the leader against them. Even Qudama al maqdisi didn't even say that, mate. You believe Hussein radhi anhu should have been fought. And if you were around at that time, you would have joined the army of Yazid. Quite clearly, mate. Now what I'm going to do is present the actual statement of Ibn Qudam al-Maqdisi. As you can see on screen, you got the book Al-Mughni. And Ibn Qudam said, it is obligatory upon the people to help their Imam in fighting against the rebels. Because if they were to leave off helping their Imam, the rebels will overcome him, meaning overpower him. And there will be tribulations on the earth. This statement here, mate, doesn't mention anything of Hussain radhi anhu. Doesn't mention any specifics. He just made a general statement. People are amongst the truth and you should aid their Imam. But he said yeah, you should fight and guess with the leader against them. He misunderstood the statement of Ibn Qudam al-Maqtasi and what he was concealing inside his heart as to how he views the khuruj of Hussein radiallahu anhu and those who rebelled against Yazid and others actually came out. Some Sahaba that did rebel before because the hadith was not widespread and the books of Aqaid was not written yet and they had ishtihad. May Allah please with them all and Allah taught us how to deal with they mistakes. So are you insinuating the companions who learned directly from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not understand creed? And the books of Aqaid was not written yet. With all due respect, my friend, the Sahaba anhum did not need the creed books from the Atba Tabi'un. They understood it direct from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the books of Aqaid was not written yet. And they had ishtihad. May Allah please with them all. How is it possible that they can make a scholarly reasoning due to their interpretation in matters of creed. Because making ishtihad can only be done in matters of fiqh. You don't treat this as fiqh, the super salafis and the madakhila. How is it possible that this man is given a mic to address an audience? I, I just can't understand, I can't find them. So we say, Hussein al is one of the imma of the salaf. He made ishtihad. As you heard, he mentioned that Hussein radiyallahu anhu made ishtihad. Now what he'll do now is, he'll contradict himself. Three minutes later, he absolutely makes a fool of himself. Have a listen. If there is a nas, la ishtihada ma ish. Ma an nas. La ishtihada ma an nas. There is no ishtihad if the, the text is clear. So there is no ishtihad when there's a text. Now you bang on continuously. They'll say, the hadith of the Prophet is so clear. The Messenger said clearly, so not rebel. So this a hadith clear. At the start of the video, you mentioned that Hussein radiya anhu made ishtihad. Now you're saying, he can't make ishtihad because there's a text. So if the hadith is clear, then there's no room for ishtihad because the hadith is clear, there's a prohibition, khalas. So, did <laughs> Kadhu Hussain Radila Anu make ishtihad when you argue that there's a text? And, it, and this is the problem, isn't it? The contradictions because they, they, their manhaj is not grounded. It, they contradict themselves and they, they fall over themselves. Some Sahaba that did rebel before because the hadith was not widespread. And why would not rebel? Because the hadith of the Nabi alayhi salatu the ahadith. There's many ahadith that the Messenger said to not rebel, the hadith of Ubaid ibn Samit, al Irbad ibn Sariya, and other Sahab, may Allah please them all. The Messenger said clearly to not rebel. In clip one, he said that the hadith wasn't widespread. Now, this ignoramus says there was many ahadith. So hold on. If the hadith wasn't widespread, the ahadith was not widespread. How could there be many hadith? There's many ahadith. But if there's many ahadith, that means this point was emphasized. So this hadith was widespread. That means the companions heard it, which means that they taught the tabi'un, who then taught the atma tabi'un. So it was widespread, wasn't it then, my friend? Because if it wasn't widespread, how did the tabi'un know this then? Because the companions had to teach it. They understood it. Underneath the Prophet's feet, listening to him. If it was many ahadith, then the companions would have been aware that there were many ahadith. So why did they still do khuruj? If you know that by rebelling, you will not cause the harm, therefore it's okay, no. Prophet said not rebel until you see clear cut disbelief. So this a hadith clear. So if person says some scholars said if you know you're not gonna cause harm, then you do it. Say no, that, that's that's they coming from the angle of the wisdom. But the illa, Prophet said it. Look how deeply rooted he is in defending oppression and legitimizing religious oppression. Shamsi said no, even if you got the ability to and it will cause less harms, then no, you still can't do it. He would prefer that even that they will cause less harm. No, don't do it. Look at this. Look at the mindset of this individual. Allahu Akbar. And this shows that they have no love for the Ummah. They are dividing the Ummah. They have no connection to the Ummah. They have subjugated themselves to becoming slaves of the rulers. The Messenger said there will be leaders who they will take their right from you and they will not give you your rights. So they said she will not fight them. 
No, they're not asking alim here. They're asking الذي لا ينطق عن الهوى إن هو إلا وحي يوحى. Prophet said, said no, as long as they establish the prayer. Because they quoted it wrong. Again, quoted the hadith wrong three months ago. The leaders who will take your rights from you and they will ask their rights from you. They will fight them until they establish the prayer. The Prophet doesn't even say that. Let's present the hadith accordingly. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Salama bin Yazid al Ju'fi asked the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, what do you think if we have rulers who rule over us and demand that we discharge our obligations towards them? Shamsi says that they would want your right from you and they would not give their rights to you. What do you order us to do? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam avoided giving any answer. Salama asked him again. He avoided giving any answer. Then he asked it for the second or third time. When Ash'ath bin Qais, finding that the Messenger of Prophet was unnecessarily being pressed for an answer, pulled him aside and said, listen to them and obey them. For on them shall be their burden and on you shall be your burden. Point one. The companion didn't say, shall we fight them? So they said, shall we not fight them? Shamsi said that the Prophet ﷺ says, do not fight them as long as they establish prayer. No, it doesn't. For on them shall be their burden and on you shall be your burden. Where does he say, as long as they establish the prayer, Namsi? Listen to what I mentioned three months ago. And does it show that Shamsi is a man of principle? Where he took the knowledge and promoted the hadith correctly. No, he didn't. Because he quoted it wrong. Again, quoted the hadith wrong three months ago. He said, I'm Miss Scott. He is miskin, this guy. He doesn't understand what is Miss Scott. I mentioned two hadith and put them together. Nah. But all of them are the same meaning. That you still hear and obey the Muslim leaders. So you heard. I mentioned two hadith and I just put them together. Grabbing one hadith from here and grabbing another hadith from here. Totally different chain of narrators. And the wording could be slightly different, but all he goes, yeah, I just put them together. Yeah, just, just like mumble jumble them up. The wordings are totally different. And you see now, the wording is totally different. So how can you mix it up? In the future, there will be leaders. You recognize them and you would... Reject them, meaning you recognize their good deeds and you recognize their bad deeds. And the one that denies it or rejects it is saved. And the one that is pleased, the one that approves of their, meaning their bad deeds, is ruined. <laughs> Shall we not fight them? And the Prophet ﷺ responded by saying, La, no, providing they pray. It doesn't mention they will take their rights from you and they would have their rights from you. Rather, it says that they will be leaders after that you know their good deeds and their bad deeds. So are you saying from this hadith, I took the end, the first hadith, I took the start and I just mixed it up together. You can't just take hadith and start mixing and mumbling, mumbling and jumbling them up. The Prophet ﷺ did not say this in one sequence. It's two separate hadith. So this is shameless, mate. You know, you are a weak narrator. He said, I'm Miss Scott. He is skin, this guy. He doesn't understand what is Miss Scott. I mentioned two hadith and put them together. Nah. But all of them are the same meaning. So now what we're going to do is we're going to show you that Shamsi is a weak narrator. If he was around the time of the Salaf, he'd be classed as Da'if. A narrator who's consistently mixing hadith up is getting it wrong. As you can see on screen. Defects in the transmitter are a result of 10 factors. Five of which are connected to the adala, meaning the trustworthiness. And five to dabt, to the accuracy. So the factors are related to adala. So I don't really think Shamsi fits in all of these, to be honest. Let's be fair to him. But the next five, oh, definitely. The factors related to dabt are if the narrator is excessive in his errors. Definitely, he's ticked that box. Number two, weak of memory. Definitely ticked that box. Negligent. 100% is tick that box. Known for a lot of misinterpretations, definitely done that. And five, known to contradict reliable reporters. The following are rejected hadith due to the above mentioned defects in the narrators, starting with the most serious defects. Based upon that, Shamsi definitely ticks off as a weak narrator. I remember the hadith of Nabi Wasallam. He said Allah will send down humiliation upon us and no one will be able to remove it. No United Nations, no America, no one. Until ila The people of innovation misguidance, they're not going to teach you this hadith. Because some of them are utilizing this event to do business, to make money, clickbait. Quoted the hadith right at the end. Why didn't you quote the hadith at the start? I've got Sunan Abi Dawood. Okay, look at the chapter heading. Babun fi nahi anil ina. The prohibition of ina. Ina is a form of, it's like an interest based transaction. So this hadith from the chapter heading has got nothing to do with bid'ah. And it's got nothing to do with shit. I got Bulugh al Maram by Ibn Hajar al Asqalani. Where does he present this hadith? Under what chapter? He presents it under the chapter of Buyu' the chapter of selling. So then what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? إِذَا تَبَايَعْتُمْ بِالْعِينَ وَأَخَذْتُمْ أَدْنَامُ الْبَقْرِ وَرَضِيتُمْ بِالزَّرْعَ وَتَرَكْتُمُ الْجِهَادِ صَلَّطُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ ذُلًّا حَتَّى تَرْجِعُوا إِلَى دِينِكُمْ But this 
If you read the whole hadith, it's got nothing to do with bid'ah and shirk. You were trying to go to right at the end and say bid'ah and shirk. Whilst we believe we should resort back to Al Quran and Sunnah ala Fahim and Salaf and avoid bid'ah and avoid shirk. Of course, this is a given. But you guys now are using hadith, not presenting its context, and just skipping right to the end and imposing your super salafi, filthy, toxic, garbage, sewage nonsense upon the people. This baby, this donkey. You see? That's the problem. The problem, the Muslims will be destroyed when they turn away from their scholars, they start following the foolish ones. As the Messenger of Allah said, Hudatha al Asnan, Sufaha al Ahlam, foolish minded and young in age. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to present the hadith and we're going to show you how this individual doesn't know what he's quoting and see how he just badly misconstrued it. So, the Tabweeb, meaning the chapter heading, is killing Al Khawarij and the Mulhideen. After you establish the evidence upon them. So, يَخْرُجُ قَوْمٌ فِي آخِرِ الزَّمَانِ A people during the end of days will appear. Young foolish people. Foolish minded and young in age. Who are these young foolish people? Shamsi just stopped there. And what does the Prophet Sallallahu say? لَا يُجَاوِزُ إِيمَانُهُمْ حَنَاجِرُهُمْ That the words will not go beyond their thoughts. And they will leave the religion as an arrow goes out the game. What did the Prophet Sallallahu advise us to do when you meet these young foolish people? Whenever you meet them, kill them. For whoever kills them shall have a reward on the day of resurrection. The Prophet ﷺ is describing to us the characteristics of Al Khawarij. Mentions nothing about ulama. And Imam Al Bukhari in his Tabweeb, in the chapter heading, places this hadith under the chapter of what? Killing Al Khawarij and the Mulhideen after you establish the evidence upon them. Shamsi, you have to stop these half-baked quotes. You have to stop these technicalities, my friend. It's not working for you. The Prophet ﷺ was saying this by describing the Khawarij. We don't follow scholars' opinions. Does it mean because you are quoting some scholars, therefore your point is valid? Ibn Qudama said, so and so said, no, 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 no. The scholars, they, some of them had some opinions, which is, we don't accept it. Because they went and guessed the Quran and the Sunnah, but we believe they never done it intentionally. So likewise, when we don't agree with Fawzan and the Madkhali wizards, who the hell are you to say, well, how dare you not take their opinion? How easy that you just basically overlook the classical scholars that we quoted, but providing infallible Fawzan says it and the Madkhali wizards, then all of a sudden, oh, you know what, how dare they, they go against the scholars. Sheikh Saleh al Fawzan, one of our scholars, you know, misguided the baby, children hate him. Sheikh Saleh al Fawzan, the best way to go back to the scholars, go back to scholars. Go back to the of knowledge, the likes of uh, uh, the scholar Sheikh Fawzan, other than them. We're following major Imams who the Ummah have paid testimony to their righteousness. Just because it doesn't suit your narrative, my friend, it's very easy for you to oppose it and say, we don't accept it. Ibn Qudama said, so and so said, no, 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 no. The scholars, they, some of them had some opinions, which is, we don't accept it. So what are you being a hypocrite for? Salah al Ayyubi, may Allah have mercy upon him, did not free Palestine with protest. But how? By cultivating the people upon the Quran and the Sunnah. According to your filthy methodology, Salahuddin al Ayyubi would, according to you, would have had deficiencies because he's an Ash'ari. So when you say correct Aqidah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through his hands, liberated Baytul Maqdis. I got the book here, Salahuddin al Ayyubi. In terms of his Aqidah, he approached the Madhab of al Ash'ari. If you go to Nawadir al Sultaniya wa Mahasin al Yusufiya, Ibn Shiddad, he said that Salah al-Din Ayyubi had a good Aqeedah. He was upon the Aqeedah of the Asha'ira. So Salah al-Din Ayyubi alayhi, was a deviant in your book. And he wasn't upon the Quran and the Sunnah. What? The fresh occupied Algeria for 132 years with Imam Abdul Hamid bin Badis and other than from the ulama of Sunnah in Algeria. They said to the Algerians, the problem is with you. The reason the French they have been occupying us for many years, the problem is with us. It's, it's just absolutely ridiculous. That the French colonizers that came is because of us. The problem is with us. Like what, what, how is that even plausible? Every nation, Muslim or non-Muslim, that was occupied and was oppressed has the right to defend themselves. And then he mentioned Abdul Hamid al-Badis. Well, you don't know much about Abdul Hamid al-Badis, do you? That's called the Sunnah. Okay, yeah. So what did he say about you Wahhabis or Salafis? Kitab Afar ibn Badis. And he says, look, he goes, I don't possess any of their books of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. And I don't know his biography, except a little. The Wahhabis are the people of falsehood who are shouting about things they do not know about and are trying to extinguish the light of Allah, but they can't. 
but yeah, you, you don't know nothing about Ibn Badis, mate. You weren't a big fan of you guys, so <laughs> just keep that in your locker, mate. See, when the ulama of Sunnah say, make peace treaty, doesn't mean they say, accept them as occupiers, welcome them. No, Salah al-Din Ayyubi did it with some countries. Many people think Salah al-Din Ayyubi freed all the Muslim lands. No, there were some lands, he, did, he was unable to free it. He made a contract, peace contract. I'm telling you, he, he doesn't know history at all. When Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, rahmatullahi made peace treaties, he made peace treaties in terms of gaining strength to fight the Crusaders. But it wasn't peace treaties where he allowed the Crusaders to oppress because if he heard of any oppression of any Muslims, Salah al-Din al-Yubi you think we're just like there was a Muslim ruler today just turn a blind eye? Not at all, mate. So get your facts correct. That Salah al-Din al-Yubi when he made peace treaties, he did it out of Maslaha. Prophet Muhammad did it. When the Prophet signed Sulh al-Hudaybiyah, that was done because there was a benefit for the Ummah. Why was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah broken? Because the Quraysh killed the Qurra and that nullified that agreement. So as soon as they attacked Muslims, that nullified the Sulh. And then the Prophet ﷺ marched on to Mecca. Why did you miss that out conveniently? But again, you just want to blind your audience. It's ridiculous. As a layman, one man on his own, I've got you on your knees, mate. I've got you scrambling. You got whole movement, you got this movement, you got that movement, you got, you know, one man. Hak will always prevail, even if from one man. And Baathil will perish, whether there's millions of you. <laughs> I'm <laughs> i